Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center's webinar series. My name is Mandy Ennis, and I'm a Program Development Coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, and I'll be your moderator, to, for, moderator for today, as well as presenting the final 15 minutes of the webinar. Um, the Invasive Species, so first we're doing the Spotted Lanternfly Impacts and Research from the USA and Perspectives from Ontario. We'll have Heather Leach and Julie Urban from Penn State talking about introduction and impacts and research. And then again, I'll finish the final 15 with introduction potential and perspectives from Ontario. So the Invasive Species Centre is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy and society. Oops, <laughs> sorry about that. Well, we will start with Heather, uh, but before we get started, uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to mention. There'll be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question at any time, you can type it into the question box. Uh, if you use the little drop down, you can, you can type a question into the question box and then we will get to them all at the end. Um, and I'll read them out to the presenter after the webinar. If you're having any technical difficulties at any time, please type them into the chat box or send me an email. Uh, which you would have received with your registration, and we can try to resolve that for you. Lastly, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar. If you could take some time to fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. So again, today's webinar is titled Spotted Lanternfly Impacts and Research from the USA and Perspectives from Ontario, and I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. So a little bit of an overview of today's webinar. We'll begin with Heather Leach from Pennsylvania State University, covering the introduction to SLF and some of the impacts and management in different areas in Pennsylvania. Uh, and other infected areas, infested areas. Uh, Heather will be followed by Julie Urban, also P Pennsylvania State University, who will talk about research conducted on SLF and its North American invasive range. And we'll end with me, and I'll summarize the research models that consider potential distribution of SLF with a focus on Ontario, as well as cover some things that are being done by different stakeholders in the province. So let's begin with Heather. She's an entomologist by training, primarily worked with integrated pest ma management in specialty fruit crops. Heather's responsible for public outreach and education on spotted lanternfly. Thank you so much for joining us, Heather, and I'll pass it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Mandy. Um, unfortunately, I can't see, see the slides advancing um, on my end, so I'm gonna go from my PowerPoint uh, and hopefully we can, we can get it straight from there. So I'll just let you know when to, when to advance that slide. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I know it's um, a nice summer day where I'm sure many of you would like to be outside and, and um, out doing work. Um, but, but as Mandy mentioned, I'm just going to talk about uh, sort of identification to make sure that everyone here knows um, what to look for when it, if it comes to Ontario. And then, of course, talk about the impact that we've seen so far in Pennsylvania. So if we move to the next slide, um, what we can see is lanternfly distribution. And so this first um, image is showing you basically the distribution in both the invasive region and the native region. So we can see that it's um, native to certain areas of Asia and from there and um, other areas. Uh, if you move again to the next slide, we have a map that's created by the New York State IPM Management Program. Um, and this is basically just showing you the map of the Northeast um, with Ontario cut out, but you can see where this infestation started. Um, and so what we have is a predominant infestation in southeastern Pennsylvania area um, that started again in Berks County, so kind of central southeastern Pennsylvania and spread from there. So all of those blue areas on the map are places where we have a known infestation of spotted lanternfly. And so it's not only in Pennsylvania, but it's also spread to New Jersey, Northern Delaware, Virginia, um, Maryland, and West Virginia as well. And then all of those locations on the map that have a red dot indicate where we've detected an individual spotted lanternfly um, doesn't necessarily mean at all infestation in those locations. But if you look at, you know, Erie County, uh, New York, for instance, we have some, um, some spots where we found uh, spotted lanternfly, again, no, no known infestations, but found spotted lanternfly close to Ontario. Um, and so certainly those red dots highlight the fact that Spotted lanternfly is an excellent hitchhiker and is able to really move well with humans, um, which might sound familiar to a lot of these other invasives that we have out there. So if we move to the next slide, and um, hopefully this video works, it doesn't, um, Mandy, maybe just let me know. Um, but basically, you can see very high infestation levels um, happening in southeastern Pennsylvania with large numbers of adults uh, mm -hmm. swarming on trees. So uh, what we're finding is, again, that not only are they in trees on, on, in parks and things like that, but they're also in backyards, falling down chimneys, um, and 
and uh, if you go, you know, kind of through these slides, maybe uh, you can see the options by the amount of on houses, on windows. Uh, moving to the next slide, we also see large amounts of egg masses being laid on all sorts of things. So this is one of the reasons that land high is a really good thing. See egg masses on our whale, chairs. And if you move to the next uh, picture, you'll see an egg mass laid on some lady's hat in her garage, right? And so we know that these insects are very creative about where to lay egg masses, and that means that they can be fairly cryptic and maybe unnoticed. So you might notice that on your hat, but underneath the flower box, you, you might not notice that, and you might sell it um, or, or move it or, or take it camping with you. And that's part of the reason that we're so concerned about the uh, spread of this insect. Um, now, you know, Mandy tasks about the, the impact to Pennsylvania. So if you move through to the next couple of slides here, um, we see basically a very interesting public reaction to spotted lanternfly. And, and in some cases, it can be very humorous where they're creating all sorts of memes um, on social media. And again, kind of going through these, these um, two slides um, where people have become very creative and, and posting lots of things on social media. And in some cases, uh, moving to the slide with, with Halloween images, um, we see people in southeastern Pennsylvania dressed up as lanternfly um, for Halloween and making Halloween cookies and, and all sorts of things. Um, and so we also have, if you move to the next slide, um, wine bottles, beer, and even um, uh, you know uh, liquor drinks at, at bars, local bars here, um, that have started to put spotted lanternfly on the labels or, or in the name because the community is so well aware of spotted lanternfly. Uh, more examples of this, if you move to the next slide, there's a family that created a, an, a phone app um, called Swisher, and it's where you can track how many lanternflies you've killed throughout the day, and it's sort of a competition with your uh, fellow community members. In the next slide, you see an example of um, folks at Penn State Lehigh Valley campus that have created art with spotted lanternfly wings um, to try to draw awareness towards spotted lanternfly. And yet again, in the next slide, you can see examples of earrings and ornaments, Christmas tree ornaments, um, where spotted lanternfly has been has been highlighted. Um, and then the perfect example, in my opinion, of this is is last year, where we had very high populations in Philadelphia region. Um, and of course, this is a is a dramatization of of what's happening here. But we had such significant populations that if you move to the next uh, animation, there you'll see that the Philadelphia police actually had to issue um, a statement, albeit it was a humorous Twitter statement, but saying, "Please calling 911 to report spotted lanternfly." Um, we, you know, we're aware of this, but it's not a police matter. And so, you know, certainly people that aren't used to seeing insects in their daily lives, especially you know a fairly large kind of annoying insect. Uh, we're, we're uh, very concerned about this. Um, so the next slide, the last slide, is I think a good cartoon that kind of shows the invasion of spotted lanternfly in a very uh, good way. We have a lot of people freaking out. We have a lot of people using insecticides, using sticky tape, um, and trying to do their best to understand this issue. Um, but it also means we have a lot of information out there on this insect, and I'm sure a lot of you who who are tuning in today um, have probably some background knowledge of spotted lanternfly or at least heard of it before and, and understand that it can be capable of causing a lot of damage. But the reality is we're still working on trying to understand what that damage is. Um, so of course, the next thing I wanna go through is identification to make sure that all the folks tuning in today know how to identify a spotted lanternfly um, in all of its different life forms. So Mandy, if you go to the slide that has the um, all the different life cycle images, uh, starting with the egg mass, which is highlighted in A there. Uh, that's how we believe it got into Pennsylvania in the first place. So again, they're fairly cryptic, and I'll show you more examples of that. Um, hard to see, they look like a splash of mud, and that's the life stage that overwinters. And so we believe that that came in um, on a shipment to Pennsylvania and then was able to hatch out. So they hatch out as nymphs um, or instars in the spring, and they, they're really small, and they sort of look like ticks, and they're black with little white dots. Uh, they're strong jumpers, and they're kind of spidery when they first hatch out and the way they walk. As they, you know, kind of grow, they get bigger, and they start to gain more color. So right now in Pennsylvania, we're just starting to see uh, these fourth instars, these red ones highlighted in C there. And then finally, um, in a few weeks here, and actually as of today, we just found our first adult down in Philadelphia. Uh, but in the coming weeks, we'll start to see more adults, and that's that winged form that really starts to draw people's attention. Um, so as you go through these next slides, again, we'll talk a little bit about egg masses. So here there should be a video of lanternfly, a female lanternfly kind of laying this covering over top of her egg masses. So you can kind of see her um, uh, move her abdomen to sort of put that covering down on top of her egg masses. So eggs are laid on any surface. I showed you uh, plenty of, of evidence of that. 
Um, they're late in the fall, um, can really span a large frame starting from mostly mid-September going through basically the first uh, hard couple of frosts. Um, and those over winter and they hatch in the spring. And usually every egg has about 35 to 40 eggs. Um, and we're still trying to, to decide exactly how many uh, egg masses females are capable. Of. But so far it looks like at least two egg masses um, is probably the average of, of what females can lay. Um, again, going to some of these next slides, eggs are often laid in, uh, in protected areas. So a good example of this is this metal pea post that was found in a vineyard. Um, and they're often found on the undersides of branches. And spotted lantrify egg masses are often laid in groups as well. So that means in the, in the picture on the right, there's, there's my hand sticking up next to a branch. And you can see that, that entire lower end of the tree branch is covered in egg masses. So we have large populations in some of these trees, which result in extreme populations um, you know, the following year with lots of nymphs feeding in those trees. Uh, moving on to the next slide, again, more examples of those egg masses um, laid in tires and uh, on camping chairs. And then um, the one fun video I have here, which I think is pretty cool, if you move to the video of them hatching, um, you can see the, the nymphs, they start out white when they first hatch, um, so they haven't yet gotten their black color, but you can kind of see them emerging out of that egg mass um, and starting to kind of inflate their, their um, uh, head region, if you will, um, and, and, and uh, pull their legs out. So it's a pretty cool uh, video showing, you know, kind of what they do every spring, and we're actually still seeing some hatch um, very little, but some hatch occurring out there uh, now as well. And then moving on to the next slide to talk about uh, the nymph identification. So we have our first to third instars, again, black bodies, bright white spots, and, and again, very strong jumpers. So one of the best ways to test if you're looking at a lanternfly is to actually poke it and see if, it, if it's jumping. If it's, if it's jumping away from you, that's a really good indication that you're probably looking at a plant hopper, and in particular, if it has this kind of coloration, likely a spotted lanternfly. So again, just kind of flipping through these slides, uh, oftentimes if you have high populations of spotted lanternfly, you'll see them feeding in groups. So this is them uh, feeding in a group on a tree of heaven stock. Um, and then moving on to this next video, which so shows lanternfly on grapes. And so in this video, you should be able to kind of see their movement patterns. They're a little bit, um, I would say maybe robotic or again, kind of spidery in the way that they walk and they're fairly quick as well. And then moving on to the fourth instar, again, those are red and quite large um, with uh, some black coloration and also those white dots as well. Um, and then the next slide, again, we have nymphs molting to adults. So when they first molt out and kind of shed their skin to go to the next life stage, they start out white, white or pink and then start to get that coloration. And then moving on to the adults, again, this uh, stage is fairly large. So we're dealing with about an inch long insect. And so that's when people really tend to notice spotted lanternfly and really learn how to identify them uh, and start reporting them as well. And so uh, here we have, you know, again, their wings um, for the most part are speckled. Um, and then they have these uh, base of their antennae is bright orange. And then their hind wing um, is, is bright, uh, uh, kind of deep red orange as well. Um, the one thing to note here is that oftentimes newspapers, they like to um, sort of pull the wings out and take the image of spotted lanternfly with its wings out. Most times when you see spotted lanternfly, their wings are actually going to be folded over their back. So you're not likely to see that orange hind wing unless you kind of spook them and, and they jump away or fly away. And then moving on to the next photo, again, that same example, you see their wings over their back um, and feeding in, in, again, large groups. And then moving on to feeding damage and talking about what kind of damage they're causing and why we're actually concerned about them in the first place. Um, so to do that, we sort of have to back up and, and Julie will talk a little bit about um, their feeding damage as well and sort of what we're finding with the research side. But just really broadly, if we talk about spotted lanternfly, one of the best ways to think about it is as sort of a giant aphid, right? So it's doing a similar uh, type of thing as cicadas, leafhoppers, and aphids, where it's feeding on the plant sap um, and then excreting that honeydew. So it has a piercing sucking mouth part that it uses to insert into the plant and feed on that plant sap. If we go one step further on the next slide, we see that spotted lanternfly belongs in the insect family Fulgoridae. Uh, so these are images of spotted lanternfly's closest to relatives. Now, not very much is known about this particular group of insects. Um, Julie Urban, uh, who you'll hear from next, is the leading expert on this, this group of insects. Um, but by and large, it's, they're not very studied and they're not studied very widely. Um, spotted lanternfly is actually the only known plant pest within this family. So it's a little bit of a black sheep. 
And the reason that I mention that is because when we talk about researching and, and trying to understand how to manage this insect, we're really starting from, from the ground up. So when we talk about other invasives, like say the brown marmorated stink bug um, or a gypsy moth, um, we start to see, uh, you know, we have baseline data on other more closely related uh, stink bugs, for example. Spotted lanternfly, we really don't have that kind of baseline information. So moving to the next slide again, where you can see it flipped over on its back with that white arrow pointing to its mouth part. So spotted lanternfly feeds with that piercing sucking mouth part and sticking that stylet into the plant sap. Now as it's feeding, just like an aphid does, it's excreting honeydew, which is sort of that sugary waste. Um, and what we're finding is that it's likely reliant on turgor pressure of that plant. And so what we mean by that is likely it's needing to feed on a plant that's fairly vigorous and actively growing. And so this might be why we're starting to see them feed on things like grapevines, which are very vigorous. We have had some other plants that really push hard um, and make it easier for them and to, to feed successfully. Um, that honeydew, if you move to the next slide, you'll see a video of them excreting that honeydew and it will um, hopefully if it works be slowed down in slow motion. So you can see that arrow and you can actually see a flicking mechanism that they use to shoot that honeydew away from them. So they don't want to get that honeydew on their wings and, and sort of gum up their wings with that sugary excrement. Um, and so what happens when you have lots of lanternfly feeding in a given area is you get that accumulation of honeydew around where they're feeding. And if you move to the next slide, you'll see what that looks like in uh, a vineyard understory with those shiny leaves and they start to get very sticky and attracting ants and wasps. And then if you move to the next animation, you'll see sooty mold, which colonizes that, that sugary excrement um, and starts to grow around uh, those leaf, the, that, that leaf material, excuse me. And if you move through the next slide, you'll see um, why this can be so pro problematic, not just in vineyards, but also in people's backyards. So this woman happened to have a tree infested with lanternfly actually a number of years ago um, where she had honeydew raining down on her deck um, and that colonized it with sooty mold. And so she had a slippery, um, slippery deck and mold covering uh, both her patio furniture and her deck that she then had to power wash. Um, and so again, this, this isn't just a, an agricultural problem, it's also a nuisance problem. So if you move to the next problem, or excuse me, move to the next slide, you'll see that same uh, thing where we have an experiment um, that uh, one of our colleagues had put in place where he used umbrellas to capture dead spotted lanternfly falling from the trees. And after a few weeks, so that yellow umbrella turned black from that sooty, again, from that honeydew deposition. Uh, moving to the next slide, we start to see that um, when we think about sort of a different context in our forest systems and thinking about not just um, urban forests or, or parks and things like that, but also um, the, the more healthy and intact forests that we want to keep free of invasives, uh, we're starting to see honeydew and sooty mold colonization in the understory. So just various examples of that and moving to the next slide where we can see uh, basically a black understory where there used to be some other small plants living and, and they had since died. Um, so when we start to about sort of the long-term forest regeneration of these plants in the understory, uh, this is where we could start to see an impact from spotted lanternfly. Now, the issue with this, when I, when I say that, I say it was a big caveat because this is long-term types of study. So it's difficult to really understand what the impact is gonna be um, right now. And so we're, we have uh, plenty of studies that are looking at sort of what that impact is to uh, forest ecosystems. And Julie will touch a little bit um, on some of those studies as well. Now, other signs of plant damage that we see are certainly plant yellowing, so with the next slide, um, and then we also see plant oozing um, or tree oozing on the next couple of slides if you kind of move through those, um, and then slimy trees where we actually are getting slime flux. Predominantly, this is on Tree of Heaven, but we have um, sort of the slime flux on these trees significant feeding damage. Um, so again, this can um, be not just a nuisance problem, but also a significant um, uh, forest health uh, issue as well. And then I will, and, um, for the most part, we're seeing the most significant damage with large established trees on Tree of Heaven. Now, uh, the next photo is an example of flagging on black walnut, spotted lantern fly, especially the thin stars, the red ones really enjoy feeding on black walnut. We tend to see a lot of um, feeding there, especially on certain branches. And so you can see some of these branches in those photos um, have died back and, and that is uh, because of spotted lantern fly feeding. So we're starting to see canopy die back, but not complete death of these trees. Now, if you move to the next slide, you'll see dead tree of heaven. So that's the one exception where a, a fully established large tree of heaven trees can die because of spotted lantern fly. And we've seen this many times. Now, if you move to the animation here, it says an ornamental plant spotted lanternfly is best considered as a plant stressor. 
So I think this is a really important message that um, we're really trying to, to, to get out there right now is that just because you have a spotted lantern fly in your backyard does not mean your trees are going to die, does not mean it's going to kill the whole forest. Um, and so we don't need to, to you know, be putting um, a ton of insecticide out there to kill all the spotted lanternfly in your backyard. It's really best to think about targeting that spotted lanternfly and where they're most likely to cause damage. And again, uh, Julie will talk about that a little bit, but I'll touch um, just briefly on host change. So if you move to the next couple of slides here, um, where it takes you to um, the preferred host and the unlikely host. So spotted lanternfly have over 70 different plant hosts that they will feed on, um, but they do sort of have a, a short list of, a somewhat short list of preferred hosts. Um, so that includes certainly Tree of Heaven, which is an invasive plant um, that is common throughout uh, the U.S. And, and I know it's in Ontario um, as well. Um, also grapes, both wild and cultivated grapes, black walnut, maples, birch, willows, sumac, syrac, bittersweet, um, and several others as well. And then it has a very short list of sort of unlikely hosts where it doesn't typically like to feed. So that includes things like conifers, black cherry, Bradford pear, and a few others that you're less likely to see them on. Now, I will again have, I always have caveats to almost anything I talk about with spotted lanternflies, where it depends on what's in the landscape. So if you have, um, say, a Bradford pear and that's all they have to feed on, they will certainly feed on that Bradford pear, but they're likely to move off after a couple of days um, because it's just not, not seeming to be a very desirable host. So if you move through these next slides, when we talk about agricultural hosts, we do see spotted lanternfly feeding on corn, on soybean, and on alfalfa. However, at this point, not causing any uh, discernible damage in these crops. Um, in hops, in the next slide, you'll see them feeding. Um, again, we, we're conducting some studies this year to really try to understand what sort of damage they can cause in hops, but so far have not seen any significant damage in hops. Um, and then, of course, we do have select herbs, um, vegetables, and berry crops that we have seen them on, um, in some cases causing damage in backyard gardens and home gardens. Um, but in terms of commercial vegetable production, we're not seeing that. And so I would say cucumber is probably the one to watch the most. And again, we'll be conducting some trials um, actually starting right now today um, to look at sort of that damage that we're seeing in those crops. And then um, talking about ornamental plants, we do see uh, lantern fly feeding on hibiscus and lilies as well, and, and several others, peonies, roses, they really like to feed on, again, dependent on what's in the landscape. So sort of my point in, in running through all of this, and if you go to the next slide, um, there's a lot that, that um, spotted lantern fly will feed on, and it becomes really difficult, and I would argue fairly frustrating to try to understand what the risk is and, and who should be most alarmed by spotted lantern fly. So um, if you work through this animation, the risk from spotted lanternfly is one, feeding damage from lanternfly. We also have the nuisance problem from that honeydew, the sooty mold, and just the bugs themselves that I talked about earlier. And then of course we have compliance with the quarantine. I'm not gonna go into great detail on the quarantine here just because I don't, I don't have the time for it. Um, but basically we have uh, businesses that of course, before they ship any material to other states and, and, and certainly in Canada, um, they have to go through a quarantine procedure to make sure that they are free of spotted lantern fly. Now, um, this is of course very important to make sure that we're not spreading it, but it means that there's additional labor that businesses have to make sure that they're following all of those quarantine procedures, um, and that can be big, uh, very costly for them as well. So moving on to the next slide and going through who is at risk from spotted lanternfly, that includes grape growers, um, where we have significant feeding damage and nuisance at wine wineries. Um, this is an animation, sorry about that, Mandy. Um, ornamental nursery operations, where we have quarantine compliance and signs of feeding damage. We have Christmas tree growers, where it's currently quarantine compliance, but also a public perception issue. Um, and then, of course, we have homeowners, parks, and forests, where we have a nuisance pest, some feeding damage, and then that sooty mold and understory dieback, which, we're, again, we're looking at um, to really understand what the implications are there. Now, again, my, my caveat here is that repeated feeding on the same tree, dry years, or potential for vector diseases might change the situation on what's at risk. But so far, I would say that these are the top four industries or, or sort of groups that are at risk of lanternfly. Now, you'll notice that, for example, I leave tree fruit out of this. Um, right now, we have not seen damage from tree fruit. I'm not aware of any tree fruit grower who sprayed for spotted lanternfly. They will certainly feed in tree fruit and orchards, but we're not, again, seeing that damage um, as significantly um, as we sort of uh, expected to see. So that's, that's the one good news. And if there's any tree fruit growers um, tuning in, that's, that's my good news for you. 
Um, really, really quickly, since I'm, I'm short on time here, I'm going to go through um, sort of those, those three main industries and, and how they've been at risk. So if we move through these slides um, and talk about lanternfly and Christmas trees, lanternfly don't feed on conifers. I, I know I told you that earlier, um, but they will use it as a launching point. And if they're using it as a launching point, we see lots of adults on these on this upper tree. That means if you go to the next slide, we see eggs on and so if you move through these slides and, and go to um, the, the next slide, what we'll see is that um, there's some bad press on spotted lanternfly in Christmas trees. Now, for the most part, this happened in 2018 only, and we haven't really seen it as a significant problem since. But if you go through this animation, we see all sorts of news stories that say there could be a Christmas tree infesting bug that happens in your house, which is going to make nobody want to buy a Christmas tree from, from this area, right? Um, but what we're finding is that reality is that risk is really low. And it's public perception, sort of the media jumps on the issue. So to move to the next slide, we did start to see bed press, um, both from Penn State, from local growers, from the grower cooperatives, to sort of walk that back and make sure that our, our community and the folks that are buying Christmas trees were educated about the problem. Um, but certainly that's something that we did not expect, that, that sort of was a, a, a situation that we had to um, work around. Really quickly, I'll talk about nursery operations as well, moving on through these next slides. Um, when we talk, to nursery growers and, and ask them what the biggest concern is with spotted lanternfly, go back to that quarantine to make sure that they don't get any quarantine violations. They don't want to be responsible for accidentally shipping spotted lanternfly. Um, they have all sorts of other concerns as well, but predominantly, again, it's that, that quarantine violation. So if you move to the next slide, you'll see that if we have spotted lanternfly crawling around in everything, right? So in pot material and plants, um, this can become extremely difficult to inspect and make sure you're free of spotted lanternfly. I don't have the time to get into it. Um, if anyone is curious, feel free to contact me, but um, there's certainly different things that these ornamental industries have taken to make sure that they're in compliance and that compliance is successful. So they're not getting lanternfly in their uh, shipping material. And then I talked about this a little bit moving on to these next slides. We don't see that damage to specialty crops, um, things like hops, apples, peaches, and grapes. Um, so next uh, video is going to kind of contradict that, right? So you've probably seen, if you're familiar with spotted lanternfly, you've seen images and videos of spotted lanterns feeding on tree fruit. Um, we do, we see it, we see evidence of it, um, but it very, it lasts for very long. And what this large flight activity um, where you have lots of lanternfly in the air, so it's moving to the next slide. Um, and then moving to the next slide, you'll see a picture of me um, standing in an orchard. And if you go through the animation there, um, that all those lanterns that were crawling on me happened within probably 30 seconds of me getting out of the car. And of course, I left the car door open on this day. Don't do that <laughs> um, if you interact with spotted lanternfly, because I spent several hours cleaning out my car from spotted lanternfly to make sure that I was then in compliance. Um, so again, this, this insect travels and it gets on people. So moving on to the next slide, just because we're seeing it in tree fruit doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily damage those trees. Um, however, I will say that in you pick operations, we have had issues where customers don't want to take their family out and, and pick apples if they're going to have bugs crawling all over them. And then, of course, quarantine inspection um, and making sure that, you know, if you're shipping apples out, then those are all inspected. And that can become, um, you know, very difficult to make sure that you have the labor and the time to do that. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk about is lanternfly pressure in vineyards. So again, moving through these slides and sort of images of lanternfly feeding in vineyards, images of dead lanternfly on the floor. Um, several of them where it almost looks like you're mulching with spotted lanternfly on the vineyard floor. Um, and then we see already in 2020, large amounts of spotted lanternfly nymphs hatching on the vineyard post where we had large amounts of egg masses. So Sorry, Mandy, for making you uh, click the button so much. Um, but again, we have high populations of mints um, feeding on the shoots and, and uh, already in vineyards. Um, and what we're finding is that vineyards are reporting yield losses and vine deaths resulting from lanternfly. Um, about 80% of the growers that were within the 14 county quarantine zones or just before it expanded in Pennsylvania in March um, were managing spotted lanternfly and 30% of those growers were reporting damage. Um, we know that the predominant way that they're using, that they're managing this insect is through insecticide applications. So they're increasing both their number of insecticide applications, but also of course their cost per acre. And we also know that this is not just an economic problem. It's not just an insecticide chemical control problem. Um, we have situations where, um, you know, these growers are thinking about the future of their farm and how this bug has really impacted their success and their ability to manage their vineyard. 
So 57% of the growers that manage spotted lanternfly right now say that the knowledge of lanternfly and the damage that they've sustained from lanternfly changes the outlook and the future of their farm when they think about replanting or expanding. And 62% of growers say that lanternfly contributes either moderately or highly to their stress level. So when I see those kinds of numbers coming from an extension perspective, that really freaks me out because it means we have very few options to control lanternfly and this is significantly impacting their production system, not just you know in terms of the, the grapes, but also on the grower end and thinking about what they're going through every day. Um, so I think you know this certainly means that we have a lot of work to do. And if you move through that next slide, um, again, going through this list of who is at risk, um, we still have a lot of industries that are impacted in very few ways to effectively manage spotted lanternfly. And so that leaves me at my very last slide, um, which leads to Julie's presentation and talking about the research that we're doing for spotted lanternfly right now and how that will segue into creating new management uh, options. Um, so with that, I will give it over to Julie. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, and I know that you have work to do this afternoon on spotted lanternfly. Um, so that was really informative, informative uh, some really cool slash scary images and video there. Uh, and so I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest and questions on that. So just a reminder that we'll ask uh, questions at the end of the webinar. So next to speak is um, Julie Urban. Uh, so she earned her PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Albany. She studies plant hopper evolution and their co-evolution with multiple bacterial and fungal symbionts. Her recent work involves aspects of basic and applied research on SLF. She's been a member of USDA's technical working group of scientists advising management and research on, the spot, on spotted lanternfly since it was first detected in the US in September 2014. Dr. Urban is the leading principal investigator on a regional USDA uh, NIFA, which is National Institute of Food and Agriculture Specialty Crops Research in Initiative Grant, uh, where they study the biology management and reducing the impact of spotted lanternfly on specialty crops in the Eastern United States. So thank you so much for joining us, Julie, and I will now pass it over to you. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay, Mandy? Yeah, I can hear you great. Okay, so and see it takes two clicks okay there we go okay so as thank you very much and i'm really um excited to have the opportunity to talk with you all today and um to follow heather mm -hmm. she gave such a great introduction um as as heather mentioned spot and lanternfly is is a, a member of the fulgority or, or lanternfly family and it, it's an obscure group of insects and as you if you notice that i study microbial symbionts, I do obscure research. <laughs> and so it's been a very interesting um, story to, to get to this place where we're doing such applied and important research for management. Um, but basically, uh, when spotted lanternfly was first detected in uh, in Pennsylvania, that was in uh, September, September 22nd, 2014. And at that time, um, spotted lanternfly, you know, was was known to be a particularly problematic pest because it had shown up in South Korea in 2004. And there it was noted to be an economically damaging plant uh, or a uh, pest of, of grapes and and of tree fruit. But primarily the damage there was due to honeydew um, deposition causing sooty mold growth on the grapes. And so when lanternfly appeared here in, um, in Pennsylvania, um, it was very immediately uh, identified. We knew what it was. And as I mentioned, um, I, it was identified in September 22nd. And by the beginning of the second week of October, the uh, United States Department of Agriculture pulled together a, a technical working group of scientific experts around the country. Um, I was one of them. There are also folks involved from China. You know, and and so the research began from from that point. And some of the very important research that was initiated was by um, led by folks at USDA, and it's continuing now to look at parasitoids and natural enemies of spotted lanternfly. Um, I got involved, and and everyone was you know working on their own research and whatnot. And uh, subsequently, I had the opportunity to come to Penn State. But what was really interesting is that, you know, everyone was doing their research and, and the, the pest was very localized. And then in fall of 2017, 
uh, we had what we thought were very small populations, but it was very apparent in fall of 2017 that populations were much larger than we expected. And in September, we saw large populations moving onto tree fruit for the first time. And so some of those pictures that, that Heather showed where you saw really essentially every square inch of, of trunks of apple trees being covered by spotted lanternfly and being fed upon by lanternfly was really um, what cranked up the interest of, of USDA and federal and state um, agencies. And, and essentially that's when research really um, became much more integrated on spotted lanternfly. And so uh, to go through that here, let me see if I can click forward. Okay, and so with that, um, with that, uh, Penn State, which our campus is located approximately three hours away from the quarantine zone where Lanternfly is located. And so this required us to figure out how to perform operations um, remotely, in a sense, to, to test insecticides. But this became our first line of research to give us a first line of chemical defense. And so we had just listed here multiple um, folks looking at contact insecticides in grapes and tree fruits for homeowners trying to kill eggs and in ornamentals and, and trying to come up with um, Bavaria or fungal-based pathogens. And so just to show you here, oh, there is a lag. So just to show you, we essentially um, worked with one of our satellite campuses at Penn State Berks and put a bunch, you know, several hundred potted um, peach trees and potted grapevines. We collected thousands of lanternfly weekly and we did, you know, we tested a, a large number of insecticides um, to see what would be effective in killing spotted lanternfly adults and nymphs. And so with that, those data, again, I'm trying to figure out which, which key most best moves. There we go. And so from that, that was the basis of, of a publication that Heather led, you know, reporting those results. But basically those data are then what became the basis for all of the management recommendations that Penn State is, is now um, presenting on their website. And so you can see this is, you know, this is a selection. Um, Penn State Extension has a very um, active uh, spot and lanternfly website where the latest, greatest um, results are displayed from our research that essentially shows what is effective in, in this case, killing lanternfly from an insecticide perspective, but also other giving other management recommendations. And essentially what, what the, the take home message here is, is that it, it's pretty easy to, to kill spotted lanternfly. Um, it's, a, it's a sap feeder. Um, it's, it tends to be a very delicate insect. So again, you know, various compounds have different um, residuals, you know, lasts for different amounts of times. And, and when you're talking about treating vineyards where you have an issue of needing to get into the vineyard to harvest your grapes when the bugs are coming in, there's a lot of complexity there. But essentially, a lot of insecticides are really effective in killing lanternfly. And then to move on here, um, another thing we, you know, we immediately started was looking at um, developmental rates. We also wanted to do work to figure out, can we predict when lanternfly are going to hatch so that we can, um, you know, allow growers to, to be on the lookout. And so again, there, were, there was um, data on lanternfly development um, and, and the timing of development from South Korea. My student, Erica Smyers, you know, did work and we worked with folks in Virginia. And, and basically we we're able to predict with, with a lot of accuracy when lanternfly is going to hatch and that has since developed into an online tool, which I'm showing you here called PestWatch, um, where you can look and based on um, how warm it's been to date in a particular region, what percentage of eggs will, will have hatched in any given area. And so, okay, the question then becomes, all right, if this insect is really easy to kill and it's pretty easy to predict the timing of its hatch, why is this such an insidious problem, okay? And so if I go to the next cycle here, one of the things, I don't know if it came forth from what Heather presented, but this insect only goes through one generation per year. It's not like a fruit fly like spotted wing drosophila where you have multiple generations, you know, that they'll reproduce every two weeks and you get these huge numbers. 
you know, it only goes through one generation a year. And so again, that poses a question, why is this so problematic when it seems like it should be easy to wipe out? OK, and so to really understand the problem and to understand what we're trying to do with our research, we need to think about um, the timing of these life stages. And again, our management recommendations to kind of tie the research and the management together, those recommendations are um, really tied to what time of year it is. And so we know that, you know, um, basically, if you look at where the, the United States federal and state governments have focused their control efforts, they have been treating tree of heaven. Um, you can read about it online, but essentially what they'll do is they'll remove tree of heaven or kill tree of heaven in an area with an herbicide and leave 10% of the tree of heaven remaining and they will treat that with dinotefurin, you know, essentially a, 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 a neonic nicotinoid poison that the plant tissue will absorb and then all the lantern fly that come and feed upon it will die. And we know that's super effective at killing thousands of lantern flies on any one tree. And that's been what they've been focused on. We're seeing population um, sizes increase and spread of lantern fly. So while that is a really effective strategy, it's not enough, okay? And why it's not enough is if we think about these other life stages. All right, we have um, lanternfly uh, lay eggs on essentially anything. Most sap feeding insects will lay their eggs on hosts that the insects, once they hatch, can feed upon, because when they hatch, as you saw in Heather's pictures, they don't have wings, so they can't really get far, or so you'd think. And so normally insects will feed, will lay their eggs on a suitable host, but lanternfly apparently didn't read that literature, and they'll lay their eggs on anything, okay? And so if, if we're in the egg stage, which is from October to June, um, basically our management is focused on trying to scrape those eggs. That's really challenging if the eggs are 30 meters up in a tree, okay? Um, we have then early instars once they hatch out, which happens, you know, end of April, beginning of May in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, again, that's going to be temperature dependent. Um, you have these early instars, and they go through a series of molts, um, and these early instars will feed on a broad range of herbaceous plants. And this is part of what makes them really insidious. As Heather mentioned, they'll feed on over 70 different hosts. And what they will feed upon kind of depends upon what's around. And so like they have relative preferences. And so often in these early stages, um, what we'll see is that you might have a very high population of nymphs, but because they're spread out feeding on so many different hosts, you're not aware of it. And so that's that's part of the problem. Fourth in stars then are those are the pictures that Heather showed you that um, where you saw flagging in black walnut. Here, the fourth in stars tend to move onto woody tissues, and they really seem to like black walnut. Again, it depends on what's in the landscape, but that's when you start to see them aggregating a little bit more because they're moving onto woody tissues, and that's kind of the first time you might recognize or might start to recognize, oh, I have a lanternfly problem here. Again, early season adults, if Tree of Heaven, Ilanthus altissima is around, that is a highly preferred host, they will feed on other things, but the other part that makes them really insidious here is in the late season, they move, okay? And, and this is a lot of what our research focuses on because here um, we, we think that, and again, this is what we're focusing on with a lot of our work, but here we think that um, partly this movement is because they've tapped out or depleted the resources in the Atlantis they've been feeding on so heavily. It also tends to co-occur with when the Atlantis begin to senesce. But here in this late season, we see them moving onto other hosts. That's when they become a problem moving in, because this is right before they lay their eggs, moving into nurseries and you know Christmas tree operations and laying their eggs and whatnot. But in this late season, we see them move onto maple. And I, and I know I've gotten a lot of questions before from, from folks in Canada being highly concerned about their sugar maple at this point. Um, we see that in, in our landscapes that, you know, in Pennsylvania, um, 
red maple and silver maple are highly preferred. We haven't seen any problem or had any reported problem on sugar maple. But that said, um, if lanternfly were to move north into areas where you have a predominance of sugar maple, it's not that they wouldn't necessarily use it if that's mostly what's around. And so that's not a satisfying question, but again, um, that's what we're trying to get to. Are, we're trying to understand this late season movement. And so if we summarize this, you know, this is the lanternfly life cycle. Why is this insect such a problem? The eggs can move far, the, the lay their eggs on anything, and they occur as eggs in eight months out of the year. So basically that gives them a really long time to potentially move anywhere. The nymphs and adults feed on more than 70 different species of plants and trees, so they tend to be broadly diffuse. The adults feed voraciously. Once they're adults, they're really voracious feeders. And so in that late season, sorry, my boxes aren't lined up there, um, they move and they feed very voraciously. And so a lot of our work has focused on that movement to try to better predict where they're going and to try to understand um, what are the requirements of their biology? Because that might be a particularly sensitive life stage that would be um, we could hit and, and maybe control populations. It also gives us a different window of intervention beyond the time where they're feeding on tree of heaven primarily. And so this is a lot of, of um, this is also why these insects are very damaging to vineyards. Um, basically, the nymphs and vineyards, um, we haven't recorded much damage, but again, Heather kind of went through this, but basically we're seeing significant losses in vineyards in eastern Pennsylvania that were not reported in South Korea. The damage we're seeing here is not due to honeydew deposition and sooty mold, it's just depletion of vines. And so, you know, we're seeing record damage, we're seeing, you know, growers are tripling um, the number of, of insecticide applications and tripling their cost and, and still to no avail because the insects will keep coming in. As adults, you'll kill them, but they'll keep coming in. And so there's one vineyard in particular where um, my student had, had you know, done some work early on. It was near, near ground zero of where we think the infestation started. And, and basically this is 40 acres that are, are, I'm showing in this photo, are completely dead from, from lanternfly depletion. Um, this grower has, has fruit in that orchard as well. Those fruit trees, again, as Heather mentioned, weren't damaged. Um, but basically, you can see this insect can, can completely kill a vineyard within several years. Heather mentioned, you know, here you see this is another vineyard, and this is after a spray, you see this carpet of lanternfly dead bodies on the ground. But the problem is, is that late season movement, thousands and thousands more will come in and continue to deplete these plants. And so you can see there's carpets of, of lanternfly beneath every plant. And again, this is one of the vineyards that we've been seeing um, damage reports from. And so what's going on? Okay, this is late season. And part of the work that I'm really interested in is looking at trying to characterize female reproductive development. And so if you're a lanternfly aficionado, you'll know that the way you tell the boys from the girls is that the, the females have this, this, the valvuli or the last abdominal segment is red. And so what you'll see is that um, you see these pretty pictures, okay, I'm biased, pretty pictures to me, of, you know, lanternfly with this pretty yellow abdomen, but that's not um, what you see in early season adults. And so if you look at the bottom left photo here, you'll see these are two females um, with their legs kind of ripped off because that's what we do in my lab. And you'll see that on the left is an early season female and there's no yellow apparent. And on the right, you see there's a lot of yellow. And essentially what's going on is that um, the tissue between the abdominal segments is yellow. So as the lantern flies feed and become more um, fat, and their eggs developed, you see an expansion of their abdomen and you'll that exposes that yellow area. And you can see it over on the right, it starts with the side being exposed. It's kind of like they're wearing their, their stretchy pants at Thanksgiving and feeding like crazy and you see this expansive abdomen. But, but basically they're putting on a lot of weight because they're feeding a lot. 
And so last year I collected um, adults. This is not just females that are feeding voraciously, it's also males. But if you, you know, I recorded the mass and the change in mass of males and females over the course of five weeks of those lanternfly coming into this, this vineyard. And, and basically, I don't know if it's cut off to you or not, but basically you'll see that females increase their weight, you know, over 50% over the course of five weeks. So again, they're feeding very voraciously. That's why they're doing so much damage. And so in, in that, what's really interesting, you know, if we look at trying to predict insect development, temperature is a really good predictor of insect development. And so what we know, and if we talk about degree days, you know, that's essentially um, temperature accumulation here. And so if what this chart is trying to show is that it essentially, you know, we see the first adults occur after they've accumulated 1200 degree days. So if you think so basically, you know, that tends to happen in early July. So it takes 1200 degree days to get from egg hatch to adult. And, and it's over the course of 600 more degree days that we see um, all of the adults emerge. But it takes an additional 250 degree days until we see the first eggs being laid. So essentially, um, if you think about the amount of time it takes you to become an adult, they take almost half as much time beyond that to become reproductively mature. And so part of what we're doing is I'm doing a lot of dissections to try to look at exactly when mating is occurring, to try to figure out when we're at risk for insects um, moving and infesting new areas and whatnot. But essentially what this next slide is gonna show you here is, is essentially um, it takes a really, really long time. If you look at calendar days, you know, we see the first adults emerging at the end of July. You know, we see no more four thin stars by the beginning of September, but we really, really don't see any egg deposition even starting until the end of September. So they have a great period of time that they require to reproductively mature. And again, we might be thinking this could be an Achilles heel for spotted lanternfly. What, how this relates to, again, my research is, is pretty much what I'm trying to do is in, in our lab, I'm trying to do these dissections. And if you look in the top left, you can see this is female ovarial development at a very uh, young stage. And you can see they're more developed. We're trying to figure out, this is the spermatophore, what the male passes to the female on the far right, trying to characterize when she's mated and when the eggs develop. And again, how this works if you have subsequent clutches um, and, and what is the timing of that. And so far, I think some of the best um, news that, uh, that I would have for Canada is that it seems like from a temperature perspective, you might not have enough, lanternfly might not have a long enough window to get very far into egg maturation in more northern climates. But again, that's one of the things we're working on. And what's also interesting there, again, to really now talk about some of the research here, is that like aphids and other sap feeding insects that feed on nutrient poor sap, um, lantern flies and, and other plant hoppers have actual organs that are filled with bacteria that feed them from the inside out. I mean, we all have bacteria in our guts. You're familiar with the human microbiome. You know, those bacteria help us digest our food and, and help us with everything. But here, this is a, a special story, is that um, they actually have organs, and these are housed, these are shown here from some early light microscopy work that was beautifully done in the 1940s, that these are organs that are filled with bacteria. So if you think, if I were to look inside my liver, and my liver wouldn't be Julie cells, they'd be bacterial cells, that's what we're talking about here. And so if you look at that in spotted landerfly, nobody's really done this. These bacteria have co-evolved so long with these insects, you can't grow them outside, but actually you have organs that are filled with these bacteria and so this is one they have three different organs that have three different species of bacteria this bright orange one that we scientifically call the sausage is a new one that I've kind of discovered and am describing here the other organs are these little stringy things on the side and what's really cool is that in as these insects are developing in this late season for those bacteria which um, make amino acids that are missing in the plant sap that essentially give the insects the protein that they need to, to live. Um, for those bacteria 
to get to the offspring, they have to be transmitted to the eggs. So part of the really cool story is how do these bacteria move into the eggs as they're developing? Because I think that's something that's happening in the late season that's like a sensitive period that we might be able to disrupt. And so if you look, these are the, those bacteriomes is what we call the organs. And if you look at um, where they occur, basically they're kind of connected to these um, to the gut early in the early in the year. I do a lot of DNA sequencing to track where these symbionts are. They're these shreddy little tissues. But if you look at later season development, you can see that those endosymbionts actually are touching the eggs because the bacteria have to get into the eggs. And so again, that's something we're looking to disrupt because it's a really weird part of their biology. And just to go back here, if we can disrupt that, that would give us a highly specific way to kill lanternfly and not other things in the landscape. And so that's um, one area of research we're going in. Another area of research though, kind of focuses more on what I was talking about, that late season movement. If, you're, if you have an insect that's feeding on over 70 different things and in the late season it moves off of Tree of Heaven and feeds on whatever else it wants in that landscape, depending on what's around, we realize that maybe we need to take a landscape and not a tree species specific approach to treatment. And so this is something using Bavaria, which is an insect entomopathogenic uh, fungus that's uh, you know like a, um, a, a safe biocontrol. Um, this was tested last year at a park. And essentially what they did is we had a series of plots um, that were either half was a control and half was treated. It was sprayed, uh, sprayed with this um, insect pathogen compound and found, if you can see here, it was being sprayed. And these, this is spraying spores that are already commercially available and, and safe for other, other crops and other situations. And you can see insects that were nailed would be hit with these spores. These spores would penetrate the insect and kill them. And you get all sorts of fuzzy little dead bugs. And what they found was that that was effective, essentially, in reducing um, populations by about 40%. And so there's another study that's underway right now that Heather's helping with, um, basically where we're doing aerial applications and ground applications to further test these, these components. And so we're hoping um, USDA and uh, state agriculture departments are looking for our results here. Um, if we can have some landscape-based tools where you could come in and more broadly apply to knock the population down, I think that's going to really help us, and that's going to help for pop-up situations, which are new infestation areas. So that's an active, important area of research. I'm running out of time here. Another area of research is trying to figure out from the physiology of the grapevine perspective, what is lanternfly doing that can let it wipe out a vineyard? And so here is a study um, that our, our viticulturist, Michaela Centenari, is leading. And basically, we have um, a number of, of grapevines that, that uh, a hobbyist allowed us to um, do our research on, because when you're going to kill grapevines by introducing lanternfly, there's not a lot of growers who run a, really want to let you do that in their vineyards. And so Martin Kubek allowed us to do this. And you can see that there's dendrometers and sap flow meters that are attached to these plants. And there's a whole variety of physiological measures that are being taken. And we did this last year, and we'll do this again this year. We've introduced either no or medium low, medium, or high numbers of lanternfly per cage, allow them to feed for several days, take them out, you know, simulating if a, if a grower were a spray, and then um, introducing them again and, and looking at aspects of great bug physiology. And, and the take home here is that we're essentially seeing um, a pretty quick reduction in, in photosynthesis. And so um, with this, what we're trying to get to are our threshold levels, how much lanternfly needs to be there to economically um, cause you, you know, elicit the need to treat. And, and so that's something we're working on. Another thing we're working on in our lab is because we're seeing some um, physical damage to the plants, we're trying to understand better the nature of spotted lanternfly feeding. And so one of the things you can do is you can, if I have like, 
if you hook up a lanternfly, which is this poor little buddy down here, um, to a gold wire, and you put a, a probe in your plant, essentially you can run a current through the lanternfly, and this has been done well with aphids and whatnot. And, and basically, you can get a waveform that reflects the feeding behavior of the insect, so you can figure out when it's salivating, when it's probing, when it's inserting uh, its mouth parts into phloem, into xylem, and, and whatnot. And what we're seeing are really different patterns in the feeding behavior of even first and second instars. And so some of this has to do with how this insect might be overcoming plant defenses. So we're trying to get at the logistics of exactly what is it physically doing to the plants to try to better characterize why we're seeing so much damage in grapes and potentially you know, what damage uh, impacts there could be in other crops. Other research going on is that folks at USDA led the sequencing of the plant hopper genome here. And so um, other folks are looking at using RNA interference or other more genetic ways to try to um, come up with specific uh, management implications for lanternfly. And then again, a ton of other a ton of other research going on just to, you know, where Heather is leading a landscape analysis of movement and feeding behavior in vineyards. Folks are looking at flight behavior and dispersal. We're modeling the development across the life cycle. We're testing, can it transmit pathogens? Um, we're also looking at the dependence on tree of heaven. It seems like it needs a mixed host diet. But again, we're also looking at um, trying to figure out how do you safely apply insecticides that have reduced impact um, on non-target non pests and whatnot. And so kind of just to summarize here, again, folks are continuing to look at parasitoids and pathogens and other enemies that can kill these insects. A lot of folks going looking at traps and modeling and whatnot. And so kind of to summarize that, uh, I, I have a paper out if you want to understand more um, the dynamics of this pest. But, but basically, we have an organized research effort right now, as Mandy mentioned when she introduced me, um, Heather and I are co-leading a, a $7.3 million grant from USDA that has um, multiple institutions working with us. I have over you know, 40 researchers and extension folks where we're trying to use the money that we have in a very coordinated regional effort to, to come up with the best research that will inform our management decisions. And with this, we had to have um, some matching funds. Growers allowed us use of their land um, in the in the value of $5 million. Um, so basically, they're investing with us, and we're working with, with regional growers to try to make sure that the research that we're doing is informative and useful to them. And so with that, sorry, I think I'm four minutes over, but that summarizes my research um, and my, my update on what we're doing in research in spotted lanternfly. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks so much, Julie. Uh, you've learned and worked on so many aspects of SLF already. Uh, we'll continue to pay close attention in Canada for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's terrible that you have to spend so much time with all the effort uh, and damage on the ground, but it's good. It's good work that you're doing. So I'll finish up this uh, webinar. Um, to reiterate, uh, I'm Mandy Ennis. I'm a program development coordinator with the Invasive Species Center. My focus here is mainly on research, but I started my position at the ISC with a focus on SLF. Uh, in addition to my work at the ISC, I'm also an adjunct professor at Algoma University in the biology department. Uh, this is my email here, and if you have any questions, so it's mennis at invasivespeciescenter.ca, uh, you can just uh, shoot me an email if, you, if your question doesn't get answered today. So I am covering um, a couple of things. First, spotted lanternfly invasion potential in Ontario, and I'm doing this based on the current models uh, and distributions. So to begin, before I get into it, um, it pays to invest in prevention. So what this invasion curve is showing us is that investing in prevention um, provides economic returns 100 times higher than management after species arrival. So spotted lanternfly is not in Canada. Uh, it has not been detected here um, or intercepted here yet. Um, and so you get the most bang for your buck when you are working uh, at this stage in an invasive species, um, you know, potential basically. So building awareness through education and outreach is one of the best ways to prevent an introduction. Um, and, and you get more bang for your buck if you put that in, in the prevention stage. You don't want it here and then deal with, the, deal with it afterwards. 
So first I'll start with uh, the first of two models. So Young et al. came out in 2017, and the model that they used was Climax. And so what Climax does is considers optimal habitat and climate for a species, and then it can predict uh, potential distribution in other areas and the abundances of the species in that area in response especially to climate change. And so when Young did their um, research, they were using data from the invasive Korean ranges of SLF. So SLF is not just invasive in, in, in the United States from North, North America, but also in Korea as well, as Julian Heather mentioned, also in Japan. Um, and so when Young did their model, they uh, were using the uh, data from invasive Korean ranges of spotted lanternfly. And so what you see here is their um, predictive model of where it might establish. And you can see that only a, a really small tip of Southern Ontario is included in there. Uh, but that being said, uh, it's important um, to note that that's a really strong agricultural region within the province uh, overall. And then if I can just show you as well, this is uh, the state of Pennsylvania here. Uh, and the darker gray, that's in the quarantine zone. And then those light gray areas are the interceptions, but no uh, uh, populations were established in those areas. So you can see that uh, it, it makes sense in Young's model where uh, spotted lanternfly have been detected in the United States. But uh, there's another model. So uh, Maxdent came out in, in, sorry, the Wacky et al. model came out in uh, 2019. They used Maxdent. So this compares optimal environmental locations and dynamics for a species using existing, existing data uh, with environmental data in other locations to see if there's potential for areas of uh, establishment or survival elsewhere. And so the difference with the Wacky model was they used data from invasive uh, sorry, data from invasive and native ranges of SLS. So they included the North American invas in invasive populations along with the Korean populations. Um, and, and their model is a little bit different. They also added in a few extra components like diapause, uh, and it provided a much, much larger swatch. So you can see that pretty much all of uh, uh, Southern Ontario is encapsulated here, even along the Great Lakes, uh, heading all the way up uh, to Lake Superior. Uh, even up into Quebec, we can see that the wacky model is showing that uh, there, there's a high, uh, uh, or not necessarily a high likelihood in Ontario, but there is still potential in Ontario. And you can see that uh, if we put um, Pennsylvania's quarantine zone right in there, uh, it's, it's in the hottest of spots. And that makes sense because some of the data was taken from that invasive range. So if we put these two models together, the young model shown here uh, outlined in red, and then the wacky model is in yellow over top, and it's just showing that uh, even conservatively, let's say the wacky model is overestimating and the young model is underestimating, that still puts a big portion of Southern Ontario uh, it, right in the aspect of being uh, a potential area for spotted lanternfly to establish itself. And so we need to be watching and we need to be careful, especially since uh, a couple of detections happened uh, in, interception story happened uh, in New York, just across the Great Lakes from, from Ontario. And so uh, that, that is concerning. It's also important to note uh, Tree of Heaven. So uh, Julie mentioned that they're still working on whether or not Tree of Heaven is absolutely necessary for the species, uh, but it's definitely a preferred host. And so it's important to note where you can find that in Ontario. This uh, distribution model is from, in the gray here, is from a little bit of an older paper. And so um, Tree of Heaven or Alanthus might have spread out a little bit from here. So this might be a little bit of a cons conservative um, map. But uh, Tree of Heaven, it can, it can have others lookalikes that, that appear like it. It's also an invasive. Um, sumac is a species um, that's, that's here that looks really similar to the Tree of Heaven. Uh, but the way of determining if you've got Tree of Heaven near your property is these glandular teeth at the leaflet base. So the compound leaf, that center ratchet, has a bunch of these little leaflets coming off of it. And at the base of each leaflet, there's going to be these extra little sort of teeth, like a little bit of a, a lobe sort of sticking out at the base of each one. And then there's a flower, and the flower generally sits in the center of a big cluster of these leaves and leaflets that surround it. Another way of telling if you've got Tree of Heaven and not sumac is if you walk up to those leaves and you sort of crush them in your fingers, uh, they're really funky. They stink really bad, like uh, burnt peanut butter or popcorn. Uh, and so if, if you're not sure about the glandular teeth, you can also crush it up and see if you're dealing with a Tree of Heaven. And now let's just show, uh, so that tree of heaven distribution with the young model. 
Um, and then also the tree of heaven, heaven distribution with the wacky models. So you can see that uh, they they are really uh, you know closely related uh, in their distributions in both cases. So the wacky model may be a little bit more uh, sorry cohesive with uh, than the young, than the young model, which tended to be a little bit more conservative. So now we know that it's not here yet, but there is potential, especially in Southern Ontario. It's not only Southern Ontario, the, Mackie, the WACI model was actually put in place to determine whether or not spotted lanternfly could affect Washington uh, state. And so there are some Western provinces and also uh, even uh, Acadian provinces to the East that are also capable of, or potentially capable of um, uh, having a spotted lanternfly invasion. So uh, perspectives from Ontario at this time. So because we don't have it yet, what we're focusing on most here is spotted lanternfly education and outreach. And so at the Invasive Species Centre, uh, that's important to us. That's our bread and butter. So uh, we, we have a, I'll, I'll talk about the committee, the materials, some in-person uh, information that we've passed along, digital information, and then uh, reporting, which is very, very important, especially uh, at this part of the invasion curve. So to begin with the committee, uh, we have uh, the Invasive Species Centre reached out to a number of different um, uh, agencies who have a vested interest in uh, spotted lanternfly potential establishment. And we meet uh, once every couple of months just to talk about what's been going on. Uh, we share all information with one another. Uh, and so these uh, these folks come from government agencies like the Canadian Food Inspect Inspection Agency, Agency, uh, the um, Ministry of Agricultural Food and Rural Affairs, or OMAFRA. We have a lot of members from OMAFRA. Makes sense because um, you know agriculture is a big problem for spotted lanternfly. We also have uh, a couple members from the forestry industry. So we have the Ontario Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and Forestry and Eastern o Ontario Model Forest. We're paying close attention, uh, especially for maple syrup. So as uh, Julie mentioned, maple syrup might not be a problem in Pennsylvania, but who knows if uh, it were to get into Ontario. It's worth paying attention. And then we also have um, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters who have an invasive species division. And then of course, the members of the agricultural industry. So we have members from the Ontario Tender Fruit Growers, uh, Grape Growers of Ontario and Apple, oh, sorry, Ontario Apple Growers as well. So some of the things we've done uh, as, as a part of the committee is we've put some materials together. Um, myself and a colleague managed to get to New York uh, last year for um, a little um, a conference that they had put on for spotted lanternfly in Broome County. And while we were there, we took a trip down to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and got a chance to see spotted lanternfly infestation in action. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting, we were there, and at first, you know, you can't see anything, and then all of a sudden, they're all you can see. Uh, and they're crawling all over everything, and uh, so we managed to take some. We, we killed them and brought them back over uh, and pinned them into these great display cases and passed out display cases to each of our members so they can go out and, uh, you know, show exactly what spotted lanternfly look like. And so we have an opened wing version and then a closed wing version, uh, of course, with the back sticking up because, uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, you're more likely to see that tented wing version than that open wing. We also have some available materials. So if you're interested, uh, you're in the industry, you have a billboard, or you just want to have some information to pass out, uh, we can provide these for you if you just uh, shoot me an email. So we have a poster that was done in collaboration with the uh, CFIA. Uh, that's available in English and French. So that's a one-sided poster. We also have a two-sided technical fact sheet also available in English and French. And, uh, and then we have some postcards that are available digitally. So the, the poster and the two-sided technical fact sheet we also have available in hard copy should you need some. And then other materials, so we get a lot of our information out in like the fact sheet and the poster goes out in some industry newsletters. So uh, Grape Growers of Ontario, Ontario Tender Fruit Growers, Ontario Apple Growers have all included some information about SLF. Um, and we're talking to Eastern Ontario Model Forest about, um, you know, some some uh, maple syrup outreach and things like that. Also, it's important to know that spotted lanternfly is a regulated pest by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency since 2018. So they are paying attention. They are looking out for SLF for sure. And they're also creating a detection and survey protocol uh, that will be available soon. So uh, at the ISC, we've tried to reach out in person to as many people in pos as possible. Uh, we had uh, a 15 minute presentation at a nursery grower short course. Um, Myself and, a, and my colleague uh, Kristen went to the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Convention in Niagara Falls. 
Um, this is that picture that you see, that's me there. Uh, you can see our banner on the side of reporting information. Heather actually was there as well, and she shared some of our um, Education Outreach Committee slides in two talks, one to the tender fruit industry and one to the grape growers industry. So that was really great too, just to let everyone know what Ontario, uh, some perspectives in Ontario were up to. And then we also had a uh, forest pest information night in Niagara-on-the-Lake where we ho uh, focused on three different pests in that uh, particular area. So a hemlock woolly adelgid, oak wilt, and uh, spotted lanternfly. And we gave a 20-minute presentation on spotted lanternfly there. And then um, the Invasive Species Centre just launched uh, our new website. And we have a new spotted lanternfly webpage that's going to, uh, or, or that does uh, reflect the current research. So the wacky models, young models uh, information is on there. And we also put out a lot of digital media. So uh, the one that you see on the side, um, that's actually when that wacky model first came out. We wanted to uh, send out a social media blast saying that uh, spotted lanternfly is out there. Um, and uh, it, there is a capability for it to establish itself in Canada according to these models. So we were sort of letting everybody know. And then finally, uh, and most importantly, uh, you know, the reporting. So if you were to spot spotted lanternfly, uh, here's a couple of ways of letting everyone know. So you can uh, get in touch with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency at www.inspection.gc.ca slash pest. You can also, um, if you're in Ontario, use EdMaps Ontario, and there's a 1-800 number there and also online. You can even download an app for EdMaps. Um, but uh, if you're outside of Ontario, you can do the, the CFIA reporting for sure. Uh, so thanks so much for, for your time. So I just want to reiterate, my name's Mandy. That's my email. Uh, I'm on top. And then uh, this is Kristen below. So she's actually taking over uh, the Education and Outreach Committee um, and she's dealing with spotted lanternfly quite a bit as well. So I wanted to add her email and then just show you uh, this picture that I had put up at the beginning to introduce myself. That's actually me and Kristen at the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable uh, uh, Convention in Niagara Falls. So um, just quickly before we get to questions, I just want to promote um, our EDRR program is hosting an introduction webinar for Eastern Ontario organizations interested in invasive species on July 13th from 1 to 2. You can register at invasivespecies.ca. Uh, and for additional invasive species resources, check out our website at www.invasivespeciescenter.ca, where you can also sign up for future webinar invites, our quarterly newsletter, and our biweekly media research um, and, uh, and, and all kinds of events um, that we scan for you. And then finally, um, uh, thanks for listening. Don't forget uh, to fill out our survey at the end and we will take questions now. Uh, so first actually, let me thank Julie and Heather for presenting today and for everyone else for tuning in. So does anyone have any questions to start? Okay, well, I have one um, um, that came in ahead of time. So this is uh, uh, maybe to Heather or, or Julie. If I see SLF on plants or trees in my yard, uh, what should I do? And maybe specifically tree of heaven, should I remove it to be safe? This is, a, this is Heather speaking. That's a very good and very uh, hard to answer question. <laughs> um, so if you have a spotted lantern fly in your backyard, especially if it's feeding on tree of heaven, um, you know, our current uh, information is to remove that tree and, and remove the host of tree of heaven. Uh, um, and so for lantern fly to hopefully uh, not be as attractive to your backyard. Um, now we do get a lot of questions asking, well, if I remove my tree of heaven, is that just going to push them on to say my maple tree or maybe my cucumber plants, my vegetable garden? Um, and that's a really good question that we don't currently have an answer to. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're, if you're financially able to, and if you would like to use that tree of heaven as a trap tree, that will probably be the best bang for your buck. So what I mean by that is to treat that tree of heaven with a systemic insecticide very similar to what our state departments of agriculture and U.S. departments of agriculture do um, to basically draw in lantern flies so that's an attractive host for them to feed on, but then because that has been uh, baited with a poison, uh, you then kill a lot large numbers of lantern flies. So I, I would say that's probably the best option for you. And if I could, if I could add on to that too, um, is that uh, 
like we're seeing because lanternfly is is hitting um, high population areas are hitting uh, Philadelphia, right? Right, which is a, a highly populated city, and and people are kind of freaking out and and want to spray the heck out of everything, right? And so part of part of the answer is also um, trying to manage people's expectations. You know, if you see a few lanternfly that show up on your rose bush they're probably gonna be gone, right? And in a couple of days, you know, something like a softer, you know, um, a softer insecticide might do it. But but if we see, you know, that picture that Heather showed of, you know, the video of the silver maple tree teeming with lanternfly, um, we've had folks who've had a silver maple tree, uh, one of our, our extension educators who came to us from uh, having his own landscape business, he injected a silver maple with dinotefuran, so it was a, a, a poison that then killed any lanternfly that subsequently fed on that tree. And within the course of seven days after treatment, that effectively killed 14,000 lanternflies feeding on that one tree. So, so I would say if you if you have a few lanternflies, you know that's not something you necessarily want to spread a lot of toxic chemicals on. Um, but if you have something that is a large infestation. I would be more likely to treat that, if that makes sense. Uh, my apologies. I'm just having a bit of technical difficulties with my question box. I think I might get my... <laughs> I'm here, Mandy. I can read them. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so the next question is, going forward, would you be able to extend the GDD model map into Ontario and Quebec? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, um, basically, I'm not sure if, if I can look into that to see if PestWatch has any adaptations to do that, if that's something that's, because I know that 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 particular model was developed for other pests, at, at, or, or at least that capability um, to pull in the temperatures um, was built for other for other pests. And so I can certainly look into that. And um, also to extend that, I think the other part that I think is really important is looking at the growing degree day requirements for the different life stages and for female maturation. And, and definitely, I think that's going to be something that's probably um, likely to be more predictive and informative for um, for your area in terms of whether or not you can um, have populations that can remain established and go through their whole life cycle up there. But but I will make a note and I will check to see if that model um, has the capability right now to extend beyond the U.S. Okay, uh, the next question is, is the general public able to kill the egg masses by squishing or any other means? I can get that one. Um, so squishing does work. Uh, this, <laughs> this is the growth factor. Um, the way that you know you're doing your job right is those eggs are filled with, you know, baby, uh, baby lanternfly. So you know you're doing your job right if it kind of pops and squeezes out. Um, so you have to make sure that you get um, a nice, nice good squish, if you will. Um, now, if you're scraping those egg masses, um, a big thing you have to keep in mind, if you're just scraping them down to the floor um, of the ground, they still will hatch, or at least a subset of them. So you have to make sure that you scrape them into a secondary container, and you can either put those egg masses, you know, maybe at home, um, or submerge them in some sort of, so like rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer would, would kill those. Okay, um, the next question, um, well, this is just a reiterate, it's not a question, it's just a reiteration that if in Canada you find an SLF on your tree, um, best option is to report it. Um, the next question is, are there any native North American insects that feed on SLF? Hmm. Uh, I can take that. Um, basically, generalist predators. Uh, things like wheel bugs, assassin bugs, um, praying mantises, spiders, those kinds of things, but not anything in in really high enough numbers to be significant um, in terms of depleting populations. But that's also something that is another area of of active research that I kind of didn't mention about uh, mention uh, because spotted lanternfly 
uh, feeds upon tree of heaven and um, black walnut. You know, those are trees that are defended themselves with secondary plant defense compounds and on different alkaloids and whatnot. And so kind of the the lore or some things that have been written about in the literature but not really well shown um, suggests that lanternfly is toxic to predators. That's why as four thin stars, they're red, and that's why they have the hind wing red coloration that, you know, that serves as aposematic or warning coloration to predators that set, you know, that tells them I'm toxic, don't feed on me. And so that's an active area of research where um, Kelly Hoover, one of our scientists at Penn State, is um, going to rear lanternfly on Tree of Heaven and other plants with toxic compounds versus without and test palatability to predators, including birds. Um, but we also have uh, a, a colleague who's uh, an ornithologist who's getting and accumulating reports from different birding groups um, around the region who post pictures of different birds feeding on spotted, spotted lanternfly. And, and the idea is that we haven't seen that much, but birds, um, uh, feed on new pests as a function of learning. And so we're interested to see if, if we're going to see more reports of birds becoming um, more active predators than they have been to date. So that's kind of some, some cool cutting edge stuff that's going on. Um, okay, the next question is, if black walnut and maple are other hosts for SLF, what would be the best way to monitor for the fourth instar stage? That's a good question. I would say Tree of Heaven is a big one. Um, black Walnut, I would say Sumac is another one. So Staghorn Sumac, I know Mandy mentioned that you have had a fair amount of Staghorn Sumac up there. Um, and I, I wouldn't just focus on the tree species, but I'd also try to think about what your high risk pathways are. If you're thinking about maybe, you know, starting up a monitoring program um, and thinking about highways, rail lines, um, along rivers where there tend to be more disturbed habitats where those kind of um, you know, sort of quote unquote junk trees or, or junk plants might grow like Tree of Heaven. And again, opening that up for a window for lanternfly to not only potentially get in through, you know, traffic coming in, um, but also then establish on those plants. And if I could add to that, I mean, I think this is a, if, if you don't mind, um, like a good anecdote is like when we were out for uh, one of the earlier years, um, my my student, you know, lived out in the quarantine zone, and and there was a woman who was a neighbor close to where she was living, and she told us, oh, you can come in, and you know, I, I keep having lanternfly on the grapes in my garden. Please come in, and if you want to, you know, collect them, you can. And so when we went to her yard, she said, oh, you know, feel free to roam around, and we saw in that the edge of her backyard in the neighboring woodlot there it was it was a highly disturbed habitat there was all uh you know it was filled with um black walnut and and tree of heaven and um and basically we saw the trees were flagging and we said oh my i bet you know i bet they're back there so we, so we went there and and literally there was a wall of lanternfly red nymphs just like covering you know every piece of vegetation we could see and she and her husband came back and they wondered you know what are you looking at and and we pointed we said those and they were horrified and they immediately said they had that oh my gosh that's not our property you know but but the, the point is they were horrified. They couldn't figure out where the lanternfly were coming from because they were watching their grapes and the fruit and the plants that they cared about in their garden. People tend to not look at disturbed habitats because you don't care about those plants. And so I, just to you know take that personal story to reinforce what Heather said, look at your disturbed areas, which are your areas around those transportation corridors because that tends not to be where people look, but that's where you're gonna see it first. Okay, um, the next question is, do early instar nymphs tend to stick around the trees nearby where they hatched? Um, I can try to take that one. Um, so again, complicated question. Julie kind of got at this um, talking about um, how early instar nymphs tend to feed on all sorts of things. So when they first hatch, um, we tend to see a lot of egg masses laid where those adults are sort of um, feeding late in the season and they, they um, are, you know, about to, to die off and they lay their eggs close to where they're feeding. 
So that tends to be on hosts like maples um, and, so, and willows and kind of late season hosts. Um, so we tend to see large numbers of egg masses on maples. So when they first hatch, I would say there's a, probably about a week, a couple of days to a week period where those early instars move up right into the canopy and start feeding. And that seems to be the first thing they need to do. Once they sort of get, you know, settled in, take a meal, um, then they start to move around to more herbaceous things, maybe in the backyard. Um, and again, that can be almost anything. They just move around and, and sort of stick their mouth parts in anything and, and sort of take a meal. Um, and so I would say they, they stay put for a very short time and then they really start to move throughout the landscape. Okay, um, the next question is, have you tried broadcast release of sterile males to bind up the reproductive cycle in spotted lanternfly? Um, I'll take that. Uh, uh, no. And and the answer why um, that's that kind of approach is somewhat problematic um, is that it is so challenging to rear spotted lanternfly. Um, until like in South Korea and up until very recently, um, nobody and, and a lot of us are trying, nobody's been able to keep a sustained colony of spotted lanternfly alive. And part of this, you know, you can feed them potted plants, but basically you have to keep trading them out because they deplete them. And so even um, even with, you know, like folks like Kelly Hoover who are who are exposing lanternfly to um, mixed assemblages of trees, some of which can train tree of heaven, some of which don't. Um, she's been able to get them through um, reproduction, mating, and egg hatching the next year. Um, but still, once those in individuals die, like I'm doing the dissections, internally, they're a hot mess. I mean, they're very malformed. And so um, we're barely able to, uh, keep them alive long enough to do the research that we need to in very limited sections of their life cycle. Um, we have a colleague at USDA, Tracy Lesky, who has a larger quarantine lab where she's having more success, but we're nowhere near being able to mass rear lanternfly for something like that. I mean, we've certainly thought of it, and that's a really great question, but we're, we're nowhere near close in, in being able to um, rear this insect. Uh, the next question is, do we know the ID of the specific bacteria that are the endosymbionts in SLF? Uh, yes, that's something that I'm actually working on. Two, the two primary symbionts, one that, that were in those like stringy fibers, one is Celsium mulleri. Uh, that's uh, an endosymbiont that is um, shared by not only the different 14,000 species of plant hoppers in 21 families, but also cicadas, tree hoppers, um, leaf hoppers, spittle bugs. And so we know that's who that is. And from the, the uh, preliminary genome prediction that I've been doing, it's making amino acids missing in the plant sap that, uh, that it, which is the same thing it does in cicadas and leaf hoppers and whatnot. Uh, the second symbiont is Vidania fulgority. Fulgoroidea, and that's ancestral to the plant hopper superfamily. And so again, it's also provisioning essential amino acids. And the third one is one that um, I'm doing phylogenetic reconstructions to figure out from the gene sequence uh, of a 16S gene of a ribosomal gene, that's kind of like the species ID gene for bacteria. It's very close to the um, second symbiont that's in glassy wing sharpshooter, Babania. Um, but again, it's its own it's its own new species that I'm working on describing. So great question. So yeah, they're really um, like very diverse. They shared about those bacteria are uh, over a billion years divergent from each other. So very diverse bacteria in, in these guys. Okay, uh, and the last question is, is butternut a host to SLF? Yes, and actually can complete uh, development all the way from first in star through adult on butternut. Hey, okay, Mandy, that was all the questions, so I'll pass it back to you. Okay, so 
Thank you again to Julie and Heather for presenting today, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be posted on our website, www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. Just a reminder to please take a couple minutes to fill out that survey. We'd really appreciate it, and stay tuned for future webinars. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you.